Hello and welcome to the INCOSI ASEP exam tutorial for Chapter 10, Specialty Engineering Activities, Section 10.10, .10, System Safety Engineering. So of course the system safety engineer's responsibility is to avoid uh, fatalities, injuries, and property damage. And as all good system engineers know, uh, we want to start off with a hazard-free environment. But if you can't have a hazard-free environment, well, you're going to put some protections on the environment. And if that won't work, then you protect the human. And if that doesn't work, you can put warnings and alerts and then supplement the warnings and alerts with instruction and, uh, and training. So the system engineering handbook um, has uh, 10 chapters and chapter 10 has a list of specialty engineering activities and chapter 10.10 .10, uh, um, discusses system safety engineering. Um, so there's a list of uh, specialty engineering activities in chapter 10 and 1010 is system safety engineering. So before we jump into uh, the uh, SSE role, um, a couple of definitions. So safety is the risk potential that any condition would result in damage to the system, harm to humans operating or supporting the system, and harm to the environment. So that's the definition that's in the System Engineering Handbook. A slightly alternate way of thinking about it is safety risk potential is any condition that would result in fatalities, injuries, and property damage. And obviously you want to worry about those things in that, in that order. So the goal of the System Safety Engineer, um, SSE, is to influence the design with safety related requirements for all phases of the life cycle. So typically the concept phase, uh, you're just establishing the, uh, the, the concept of operations and the solution. And then when the design actually starts in development, uh, you want to really uh, emphasize the uh, safety requirements um, at the requirements level so they flow through the whole design process. Um, so the, the system safety engineer is kind of considered to do two things uh, listed on the bottom of the chart. One is to identify and eliminate safety risk potential. So figure out where the hazards are and then um, <clears throat> uh, categorize them. And then the second thing is to, for the hazards that will exist in the operational environment to control the safety risk potential. So to take some design steps to address the safety risk. The very first place to start with system safety engineering for pretty much all products is to start with the regulations and standards. Um, so there's a saying in system engineering that uh, regulations are written in the blood or written in, on the tombstones. And the idea is that every accident uh, that has occurred or incident, that that information is captured and incorporated into the regulations to prevent it from happening again. Um, the same thing is true for uh, standards, industry standards and military standards also try and capture all of the requirements that would result in a safe system. Of course, you don't, these regulations and standards shouldn't oversubscribe and prevent innovation, uh, but they should uh, pr provide performance standards that would prevent um, accidents, incidents resulting in fatalities, injury or property damage. So, question. System safety engineering starts with uh, which of the following? And uh, you get to pick two. So, industry standards, government standards, lessons learned, and best practices. So, the formal answer to that, of course, would be industry standards and government regulations. Um, the, the start of system safety engineering is to identify, analyze, and categorize hazards. So hazard is any event that causes harm. Um, there are lots of ways to think about hazards, and one way is to, is to think about their origin, uh, to classify them on, on, on how they occur. So um, some hazards are classified by origin. Uh, they can be natural uh, disasters. They can be anthropogenic, human-made. They can be the result of technology. Uh, they can be the result of the environment. Um, so you know, we always think of a natural hazard as being a, a hurricane or a tsunami, whereas a anthropogenic um, hazard would be something that's that's the result of a man-made uh, system. Um, the hazards can also be categorized by energy source. 
Um, so at the end of the day, um, hazards are the result of an exchange of energy. And um, so uh, chemical, mechanical, physical are all ways that hazards can occur. Uh, biological uh, is also a way uh, um, that can affect the human body and then of course psychological affects the human mind. And the effect of all of the hazards uh, obviously is uh, health, but they can also be economic as well as environmental effects. So question, the main task of a system safety engineer is to A, write safe procedures, B, inspect equipment for faults, C, identify, analyze, and categorize hazards, and D is to calculate safety risk. So um, according to the uh, System Engineering Handbook, uh, answer C, identify, analyze, and categorize hazards. Um, the, the way the, the hazards are identified, analyzed, and categorized is uh, through several different methods that are traditionally used. Uh, preliminary hazard analysis typically occurs on the very front end of the development process, um, you know, when the requirements are, are first established. Functional hazard analysis occurs much later once, the, once there is a functional design. And of course, once you have elements that are part of the function, the physical implementation, it's possible to do a, a system element hazard analysis or a uh, integrated system uh, hazard analysis. Um, other kinds of hazard analysis are going to occur later in the life cycle, but within the design process, um, fault tree analysis is very popular, probabilistic risk assessment is another way, and event tree analysis. So those are some of the terms that you will hear and um, should be familiar with, um, and they're all uh, you know, specific techniques and methods for performing a hazard analysis to, analysis to identify, analyze, and categorize the hazards. Um, in most structured, organized uh, system engineering processes, there will be a hazard tracking system. So that's a tool that documents and tracks the, the hazards. Um, so hazards are generally not something that you think up one day and then you're done. It's a, uh, a long-term process where you incrementally understand the environment, understand the way the system is going to interact with the environment, and start uh, incrementally uh, a work in process, adding hazards to your hazard list and then addressing them in the design. So which of the following is not a method for identifying, analyzing, or categorizing hazards used by the system safety engineer? Um, So uh, preliminary hazard analysis, fault tree analysis, event tree analysis are very popular methods. Um, hazard insurance analysis is just a made up uh, term. All right, so one of the things that happens next for a system safety engineer is to identify the risk of the hazard. So we want to quantify how bad the hazard is. And the way that's uh, typically done is uh, through the equation where risk equals the probability of occurrence times the severity of outcome. So we want to know the likelihood, the probability of occurrence, and the severity of outcome is the consequence. Um, so typically you like to, you would want to use quantitative measures uh, for the probability of occurrence or likelihood and severity of outcome or consequence. Uh, but many times, especially in the beginning of a of a system development, those numbers aren't known. So it's also appropriate to use a kind of qualitative measures. And um, the probability of occurrence um, or the likelihood runs from rare to unlikely, possible, likely, and routine, almost certain. So that would be the full range of probability of occurrence. And then the severity of outcomes runs from catastrophic resulting in fatalities uh, to major, moderate, minor, and negligible. And of course, in the major and moderate range, you would have injuries and uh, significant property damage. So if you take those uh, two axes, the probability of occurrence, uh, also known as likelihood, and the severity of outcomes, also known as consequence, and you map them into a matrix, uh, you end up with the diagram that's on the right-hand side. Um, so every combination of likelihood and consequence is going to have a measure of risk. The, 
the um, items that are labeled in column five under catastrophic are by definition going to be the worst, <clears throat> the most severe. And um, when they are likely to occur, almost certain, likely or possible, you really want to address those. It may be within the uh, scope of a program that a very, very rare, very unlikely event that has a catastrophic outcome may not be considered to be as important as a highly likely catastrophic outcome for obvious reasons. So the combination of the consequence and the likelihood determines the risk. And then based on the risk, you can categorize which um, hazards uh, should be addressed first and, um, and the degree of effort that should be put into them. Um, so just to emphasize that point is that um, an almost certain moderate so uh, an, ev uh, an event that's uh, likely to occur almost certain with a mod moderate consequence is considered to have the same roughly level of risk as um, a likely major or a possible catastrophic. So those, those ones that score 15, 16, and 15 along that diagonal have roughly the same level of risk. All right, so the, the risk matrix provides a way to, uh, um, to integrate the likelihood and consequence and determine the measure of risk for each combination. So the final point to make is that um, in the design process, you want to work on the red ones first. So you want to start off with anything in the extreme, uh, try and solve those, and then move into the orange, the yellow, and then finally eliminate as many of the green as possible. So question, risk is defined by which one of these four options? So the correct answer is that to multiply the probability of occurrence times the severity of outcome, also shown in the chart as likelihood times the consequence. Which hazards should a system engin engineer investigate first? A hazard that occurs routinely with major severity, a hazard that occurs rarely with catastrophic severity, a hazard that occurs rarely with negligible severity, and a hazard that occurs routinely with minor severity. So just kind of reasoning through this, we could automatically eliminate um, C, it happens rarely with negligible uh, severity. Um, something that happens uh, routinely with minor severity um, is probably also ruled out as to the first thing a system engineer should investigate. And so we're left with two options, A and B, routine with major severity or rarely with catastrophic severity. And so the, um, the, the case of the hazard that occurs routinely with major severity is red while the hazard that occurs rarely with catastrophic severity, even though it sounds like it's bad, um, is actually a yellow. So the, the combinations of consequence and likelihood play out in terms of the importance. So the second step, uh, once we've identified the hazards, analyzed and categorized them, is to take steps to control. And the hierarchy of processes for controlling is to eliminate the hazards by design selection, uh, eliminate the hazards by design alteration, so modifying the existing design, eliminate the hazards by incorporating safety devices. Um, the fourth from the top is incorporating alerts, and then the fifth is by procedures and training. So the most effective is to eliminate the hazards by design selection and design alteration. But in some cases, it's not always possible to do that. So the next uh, steps are uh, safety devices, um, alerts, and then uh, training procedures. So just to provide an example of that on the, on the diagram on the bottom, uh, we start, we would prefer to work in a hazard-free environment. Uh, that's not always possible. Uh, it, would, it would be nice, but it's not always feasible. So the next thing to do is to put in environmental protections, in this case, training wheels on the bicycle. Um, if that's not sufficient, we would go with a uh, protective equipment, in this case, a helmet, as a, for an example. Um, that might not be enough. Um, so we'd also want to provide warnings and alerts 
uh, perhaps on the conditions of the surface in which the bicycle is being ridden, perhaps on the speed or the stability of the bicycle. And then lastly, we'd want to make sure that the operators were trained and were aware of the hazards and could take steps to avoid them. And if they ended up in a hazardous situation, would know the appropriate steps to get out of the hazard. So those are all of the ways that you would want to control for safety. So question, system safety engineers prefer to minimize risks. So uh, preferably we'd want to design a system to operate in a hazard-free environment. System safety engineers, least preferable way to minimize uh, risks. So the, the thing that you would want to do only as a last resort. And that is uh, to train the operator to either avoid the hazard or to uh, resolve uh, hazardous situations. So that's the last resort. So finally, um, the system safety engineers are going to uh, write requirements uh, throughout the product uh, development lifecycle and then uh, go into testing and verify and validate that all the components and system uh, satisfy those requirements. Um, so here are two uh, examples of requirements that, that could be tested. And um, just to finish off by saying that a really fascinating um, thing to do is to go look at the uh, um, U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's website and uh, look at all of the products that have been recalled um, <clears throat> as a result of fatalities, uh, injuries, or uh, property damage. Thank you.